A widowed mother spends excruciating long periods of time cooking, cleaning, and performing errands. Additionally, she is paid by men each night for her sexual services, followed by the same routine of meticulously tidying up any traces of their presence before her teenage son arrives home from school. However, over the course of three days, her routine gradually unravels into slight disruption and irreparable complication, derailing any semblance of obsessive structure in her life. This is Chantal Ackermann's Jeanne Dermain, 23, Quai du Commerce, 1400 Bruxelles, an observant and minimalist avant-garde feminist cinematic classic, a masterclass in subtle critique, human empathy, and attention to the utmost minuscule details. Jeanne Dermain is played brilliantly by Delphine Serric, who captures the weight of every minor frustration, irritability, and disruption with an unassuming gracefulness. As of 2022, Chantal Ackermann's film sits firmly at the number one spot on Sight and Sound's The Greatest Films of All Time list, a list published every 10 years, filled with prestigious, cherished cinema, as chosen by a diverse range of leading filmmakers. With its humanising portrayal of sex workers, stay-at-home housewives and mothers, as well as the effortless ease in which Ackerman's film reveals information about its characters without reliance on dialogue, allowing the clues within its frame to speak volumes, it's understandable why Jean Dermont, 23 Quai du Commerce, 1400 Bruxelles, has been highly regarded as an essential classic. One of the key details about Ackerman's film and its reputation is its length, at just under three and a half hours long. The film confronts the audience with every single minute detail due to its very long, uninterrupted and often static camera angles, emphasising the minimalist and subtle direction of the film. A key example of earlier slow cinema, for those willing to be patient with the film, there is certainly a mesmerising quality in viewing Jean Dermann undertake the most mundane tasks, with each passing day these tasks varying and gradually disrupting, demonstrating exhaustion and isolation. Peter Bradshaw, writing for The Guardian in celebration of the film's success on Sight and Sound's The Greatest Films of All Time list, wrote that, This is an eerily unsettling and mesmeric three hour plus account of a single mother's apparently banal life in real time long takes, which progressively disclose an awful secret. With a fierce, cold, sustained blaze, the movie speaks to contemporary issues and questions, houseworkers work, sex workers work, the burden of mother motherhood and caregiving, the theatre of bourgeois respectability, the terrible loneliness of domestic life and female marginalisation, the unnoticed ubiquity of power and violence. Despite the surface level banality of Jean Delmont's actions, Chantal Ackerman's direction has filled every moment with empathy for the homemaker, the sex worker, the pressures of motherhood, and the expectations of middle class livelihood. This isn't simply a film of a woman peeling potatoes, but a reflection on female isolation and the entitled patriarchal weight on the shoulders of women. Ackerman's film focuses on its portrayal of a woman who caters to men. As Jeanne wakes up early in the morning, she grinds coffee, prepares breakfast, and polishes her son's shoes, all while he continues to sleep in comfort. She earns her money by catering to the sexual desires of men. She initially marries the father of her son because it was what was expected of young women her age at the time. Jeanne spends most of her waking time attending to housework or routine errands, with very little time for herself. The time for herself is often spent sitting quietly, staring into space. By spending such excruciating long periods of time with Jeanne Delmont. Chantal Ackerman is adamant in the humanisation of the roles of housewife, stay-at-home mother, and the sex worker. Jean Delmont is all free, and the longer we spend time with her, the more we recognise the slightest of changes to her structured routine, causing a greatly distressing impact on her. The most empathetic of viewers may even share in Jean's frustration, clearly expressed on her face, as she grinds coffee beans on the third day, or when small mistakes such as dropping cutlery on the floor causes gargantuan mental wounds. 
there is much that can be learnt about Jean Dermont as a character through the subtle revelations found within the film's framing. A photograph of her wedding day to her now deceased husband sits on her vanity, either as a signifier that she remains in mourning, or as a reminder that the wider world expects the widow to remain in mourning. Her attention to the most minuscule details reveals an obsessive compulsiveness, maybe even an overcompensation to fill her time with such tasks, because she has no other reason for her free time. She intends to hide any trace of her sex work from her son by tidying and airing out her bedroom, even washing herself and cleaning out the bath after each client, maybe due to the knowledge that her son lives with a sense of sexual resentment. Each of these revelations of Jean Dermont humanises her further. The film never belittles her for her dedication to housework and sex work, yet these details also further reinforce how her every action continues to serve everyone else but herself. Jean Dermont lives an exhaustive existence, often for the purpose of the men around her, rather than living for her own wants and needs. Caught within a traditionalist limbo that pressures women to serve men, Jean Dermont is a realistic, believable example of someone caught by patriarchal oppression. Laura Mulvey, renowned feminist film theorist, popularizer of the theory of the male gaze, writing for the British Film Institute, discusses Ackerman's film elaborating on its undeniably feminist approach, stating that Jeanne Dermont is inescapably a woman's film, consciously feminist in its turn to the avant-garde. In a film that agonizingly depicts women's oppression, Ackerman transforms cinema, itself so often an instrument of women's oppression, into a liberating force. Jean Delmont stood out as something completely new and unexpected. It was the film's courage that was immediately most striking, Ackerman's unwavering and completely luminous adherence to a female perspective, not, that is, via the character Jean Delmont, but embedded in the film itself and its director's vision, combined with her uncompromising and completely coherent cinema to produce a film that was both feminist and cinematically radical. As Laura Mulvey suggests, Ackerman's filmmaking here is distinctly feminist and radical in its confrontational, inescapable nature, forcing the audience to recognise the mundanity of Jean Dermont's existence as a consequence of women's oppression. Jean's purpose is to serve the men around her, and in her suffering of patriarchal oppression, her routine gradually slips from the strict adherence to structure into exasperation, isolation, and a quiet fury. Jean Dillemont's routine blisters and fractures in subtle ways that may seem deceptively insignificant, but for Jean, these disruptions are monumental. She forgets a single button on her nightgown. She forgets to switch off a light as she leaves the room, forgetting to place the lid back on the dining table bowl that contains her money earned from sex work. The inability to access the post office. The final disruption of her routine is during her time with a client on the third day. We finally observe as she has said, a disruption of the routine for the viewer themselves, as this is an action often held behind closed doors. Her reaction during sex is a complex mixture of disgust and orgasm, possibly a disgust at herself for feeling pleasure while attending to a client, further disrupting the routine of joyless sex. As Jean Delmont dresses herself, her client resting on her bed, she takes a pair of scissors used to cut open a parcel she received from her sister, a gift of a pink silk nightgown, a generous disruption to Jean's routine, but a disruption nonetheless, and stabs the man, killing him. After the murder, she sits at the dining table, blood on her blouse and hands, and waits. The motivation for the murder has caused wide speculation amongst the film's viewers. Is this the final moment Jean Delmont is unable to tolerate any more disruptions to her strict routine? Is the act of murder within the film an allegorical rejection of the patriarchal influence that is present in Jean's every routine action? Is it an act of protest or a character's mental breaking point? As we watch Jean Delmont sit in silence for the film's final seven minutes, a contrast to her previous solitary acts of sitting in silence, as this moment is not intending to kill free time she would otherwise spend tidying or preparing food. It may be that, within this haunting image, her head is finally cleared of prior obligations, a realisation that she doesn't, in fact, have to adhere to the strict structures expected of her. 
In conclusion, Chantal Ackermann's Jean Dermont Vent Toi, Quai du Commerce, 1080 Bruxelles, may be infamous for its long running time and a patience testing exploration of minimalism, the actions of polishing shoes, peeling potatoes, dusting ornaments, and making the bed are depicted with such unflinching attention that Delphine Sirig's performance as Jean begins to blur with the reality of actually performing these tasks. But Ackerman's film is also an intelligent and damning criticism of patriarchal pressures on women, humanising the women and efforts most often taken for granted by men, the efforts of wives, mothers and sex workers. While a film may not resonate with every viewer, much has been said about the film's ability to bore. The more patient viewers will encounter one of cinema's greatest character studies and a pioneering influence on feminist cinema which continues to inspire filmmakers that follow in its footsteps. A special thank you to my incredible tier Patreon supporter Gil and to my super tier Patreon supporters Constantin Pombelli and at Leila Lu One. 